Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown, the show where we decode the unknown. Or more accurately, Casey, the fine writer on this channel, decodes the unknown and then I read it and add some stupid comments and then Jen afterwards and some images if you're watching the video and some music and some sound effects if you're listening as a podcast. Well, as a video, you get them both. But uh, yeah, this show is a YouTube channel and a podcast. So yes, welcome. Let's jump in. Today we're talking about Roanoke. Uh, it's a colony that disappeared, right? Weirdly enough, I was just watching an episode of The Blacklist, that uh, um, James Spader show, and there was a guy called Roanoke, and I can't remember why. It was something to do with this colony. I might have fallen asleep. The Blacklist got really weird in the later seasons. I'm like, just what is going on? <laughs> We're not talking about The Blacklist today, so let's move on to the actual content that you're here for. Yes? <laughs> The Lost Colony of Roanoke is one of those enduring historical mysteries that refuses to be definitively solved. <laughs> solved. And as time goes by, more and more theories get added to the mix. To give you a very brief history, Queen Elizabeth I wanted to colonize the New World and had given her favorite nobleman, Sir Walter Raleigh, first crack at controlling as much of the America south of Newfoundland as he wanted. Ah, the past where it's just like, the queen in some random country just says to a dude, yeah, 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 just go over there and take it. No worries. Yeah, what about the people living there? Ah, oh, they don't, it's, it's fine. It's going to be ours now. It's going to be ours. Oh, colonialism. Weird times. Bad times. I don't want to say weird like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, it was weird. As a British person, you can't. It's, it's like, this is not good. It's not good. In something that sounds kind of like the beginning of an ominous fairy tale, he was given seven years to set up a colony before losing his exclusive rights to do so. The first real attempt to set up a colony under Raleigh happened in 1585. This all-male group did not do very well as their leader, Ralph Lane, was basically a giant jerk and ruined relations with nearby Native American tribes by kidnapping whenever the English needed anything and in general behaving like the world's worst next-door neighbor. Also, I mean, the very fact of him being there makes him a terrible neighbor because he's an unwanted neighbor who just, it'd be like someone showing up in your garden, pitching a tent and then being a dickhead. It would be like, wait, 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 isn't it bad enough that you pitched a tent in my garden, you homeless weirdo? And then at least you could be nice. Maybe come and knock on the door and introduce yourself rather than kidnapping my children and then making them your slaves. A bit weird. A bit weird, Ralph. Maybe don't do that. The group eventually gave up and returned to England in 1586, good, but they did bring potatoes with them, so I suppose Lane was good for something in the end. Yes, he was. Potatoes are amazing, especially when they're chopped up into little slices and fried. The next serious attempt to establish a settlement came with John White, who had been part of Lane's previous attempt, and he led a new group of men, women, and children back to North Carolina in 1587. The group in modern-day North Carolina, they weren't back then being like, let's go to North Carolina because North Carolina certainly didn't exist. The group included his daughter, Eleanor, her husband, and Anna Ana Nace, maybe, Dare. That is a great name, the surname Dare. And later on, their baby, Virginia Dare, who was the first English baby born on American soil. John White didn't stay long with the settlers and returned to England that same year for supplies, intending to come back as soon as he could. Unfortunately, because of England's conflict with Spain, it ended up taking him three years. That seems like a bit of a dick move. It's like, so what are you doing? There's this land far away that no one has succeeded in colonizing. So what you do is you pack up your whole family, you put them on a boat for what I'm sure is a horrible journey across the Atlantic. Then you arrive in America and then you're like, oh no, we need a bit more food. So you bugger off back to England and you can't get back there for three years. And your family's there. It's like, mate, what are you up to? When he did eventually make it back in August 1590, he got a huge shock. It wasn't that the settlement was merely abandoned, it had totally, it had almost totally disappeared. There were no people, no buildings, no boats. The only thing that Y could find was a single word carved into a post. Croatoan. So this is where the mystery began. Nobody had been able to say for sure what happened to the Roanoke settlers. But when you dig in a bit, there is more than one theory to their fate. Let's start with what we know. The only clue left behind by White's group was the word Croato, and this sounds creepy until you realize it was just the name of a nearby island and the tribe of indigenous Americans who the Roanoke settlers were on friendly terms with. There were also the letters C-R-O carved into a tree, but presumably they ran out of room to finish the word. So to most people, including John White, it seemed obvious that after however long of being on Roanoke Island, maybe the settlers just weren't doing that well, so they moved off to hang out with the Croato and tribe and left White a note saying where they'd gone. Yeah, I mean, it seems pretty obvious. 
right? If you were going to go somewhere, like, to pop out and get milk, and, like, if I was, and I knew my wife was going to get home in the time that I'd popped out to get milk, I'd be like, gone to get milk. Maybe I'll just even write, gone for milk. I don't think I'd just write milk, because I could write a little bit more, but if I had to carve it into a tree, I'd probably just write milk. And then she'd know what's going on. So it seems like that's pretty obvious. Fortunately, we don't have to carve these sorts of things into trees. He had been gone for three years after all, and the settlers might have been desperately waiting for things that never arrived. So they thought, saw this and up sticks, literally. All their buildings were seemingly taken down and moved, not destroyed. To further drive home the theory that they merely moved on, there was, there was no Maltese cross symbol carved onto the post, which was a pre-agreed distress code. If the colonists had time to carve an eight-letter word into the post and a three-letter word into a tree, they would have had time to carve some sort of cross too if they were being forced to flee. So, John White trucked on over to Croatan and met up with his family and the other English people, right? Well, no, wrong. He never actually made it over to follow up on his theory. What? Mate, come on, you sailed all the way across the Atlantic. White did attempt to make it to Croatan after discovering the colony had gone, but due to various things happening to the ship uh, he was on and bad weather, the exploration party had to abandon the plan and arrived back in England in 1590. Wait, in October 1590. Wait, wait, wait. So you made it all the way across the Atlantic. You got there. They were like, you were like, oh, they made, they went to the other island. And you tried to go there, but you couldn't. But somehow you magically made it all the way back across the Atlantic. It sounds like you don't like your family very much, doesn't it? What was his name? White? John White? Or either that, or you're just lazy. There was another attempt set up by Walter Raleigh to see if the colonists were still alive, but the whole thing was pretty shady. If the colonists were dead, he would lose his claim on the land as seven years of good luck would run out and there wouldn't be time to establish another party. If he could fudge the issue and try to convince everyone they might still be alive, his claim would be protected. He was also trying to get a jump on other business leads at the time and was basically using the search for the lost colonists as a smokescreen to put rivals off the scent. Other expeditions tried to find traces of the colonists over the years, but as time went by, it would have been harder and harder to work out the exact details. Relaying any sort of news was also subject to time delays, biases, and possible misinformation due to the large amount of spying going on. There were stories of massacres by local tribes, but also of contact with Native Americans who had fair skin, gray eyes, and wore a European style of dress. Okay, so that's pointing to two theories, right? Right. One, uh, they were they were massacred and their buildings i guess were stolen or used for resources or something or two they integrated so they became i mean it's over a really long time like three years at the absolute minimum so it's kind of possible that they just joined in with the tribe and then they had children with the uh, native americans and they liked some of their clothes so uh, you know so apart from peaceful assimilation with nearby locals what else might have happened well it all depends on who you believe the whole thing got off on the wrong foot from the start the settlers weren't actually supposed to colonize roanoke they had intended to travel to chesapeake but after stopping off at roanoke to check on some soldiers who'd been holding the fort after the 1585 ralph lane attempt the ship's captain simon ferdinandez abandoned them there the soldiers had also met a mysterious fate as a couple of skeletons were found but the rest of the 15 men were never heard from again the ship's captain sounds like a bit of a d he dropped off 15 of the people he was supposed to take all the way and was just like yeah yeah, yeah. have fun <laughs> knob it seems likely they were attacked by a native tribe and oh and then they died brilliant and those that were still alive tried sailing off and didn't make it but again with no actual evidence of this it's impossible to say for sure if anthropologist lee miller is to be believed the 1587 colonists were deliberately abandoned in a plot by jealous enemies of Walter Raleigh to mess up his attempt to claim land for himself. There had already been one failed attempt at Roanoke, after all, and Fernandez, Fer, Fernandez sorry, had dropped the 1587 settlers off in July, long after they could begin planting anything, so it seemed like this attempt would fail too. This all sounds really, like, just not well organized. While sabotage for political reasons is a possibility, Fernandez was also quite mercenary in a previous form as a pirate. <laughs> what is this guy doing in charge? So not only did he drop them off and then just abandon them on the island, but it's also like, why did we choose this guy? He used to be a pilot and just seems like an absolute dickhead. He might have just ditched the boring English people at the first convenient spot and then gone off to more lucrative pursuits again. Why is this guy leading an expedition? 
Spain and England were at each other's throats during this period, and some historians have suggested that the colony was pillaged by nearby Spaniards who were also grabbing up the land. The fate of the colonists would likely have been slavery or death, but there's no evidence from English or Spanish sources that the Roanoke settlement was ever discovered by Spain. Well, if Spain did discover it, uh, and I don't want to get too conspiracy theory here, but they're not going to be like, yeah, 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 we found it, and then we enslaved and executed the locals. I mean, not the locals, the, the colonists who were more local. Who... You get what I mean. Was it an attack by a Native American tribe fed up with su uh, supporting underprepared foreigners and angered by previous hostilities? Maybe, but the settlement didn't show any signs of an attack and there were no bodies left behind. Other indigenous people also reported seeing the English settlers fighting among themselves at the time, leading to a belief that they might have contracted some form of disease that caused delusions and paranoia. Yeah, if they killed each other off, though, there would have been remains to find. Yeah, also, then they got all this disease, and they got deluded and paranoid, and then they perfectly deconstructed their buildings. Ah! Ah! And then they wrote on the trees, Crow turn. Ah! No. A super unlikely. Another clue that popped up centuries later in 1937 was what became known as the First Dare Stone. This was a large stone with a message inscribed in it, purportedly from Eleanor Dare, daughter of John White and mother of Virginia Dare. It was found the first, uh, that was the first kid born, English kid born in the Americas, right? It was found near the Chowan River in North Carolina, and it was a message to John saying that they'd all had a terrible time since he left, with more than half the population dying from sickness or in war. There had then been a further massacre, with victims including a husband and child, and only seven people had survived. They had all been buried in a mass grave a few miles east of the river. It was signed E.W.D. or Eleanor White Depp. Interestingly, the reference to seven survivors matches a claim by William Strachey, a 17th century writer who had claimed that the Powhatan tribe had attacked another group and seven English people had managed to escape. Historians and the general public went nuts for the stone, but no further evidence of the colony or mass grave was found. Is this stone just a forgery? We may, may, may. Rewards were offered for similar finds, so of course, loads of engraved stones started coming out of the woodwork, muddying historical research and casting doubt on the veracity of the original stone. Well, obviously, all the later ones were fake because people love money. While 47 of the 48 catalogued stones were eventually found to be the work of one man. Whoa! Bill Eberhardt, a, as you guessed it, stone cutter from Georgia, the original stone was different enough to be taken on its own merit. Well, yeah, it just sounds like old Bill was like, yeah, there's money to be made in these fake stones, isn't there? So he got cracking on the fake stone business. Uh, it doesn't really, it doesn't really add any discredit or credit to the original stone being real or not. Just all the later ones were faken by one dude. The original can be still fake, just by a different dude. Unfortunately, it had been so undermined by the other fake stones, as well as the original finder, Lewis Hammond, being a bit vague about where it found it, that it faded in importance as primary source material. Because it's never definitively been proved real or fake, historians have shied away from the story the original Dare Stone relates. But if it is real, the settlers had a pretty torrid time of it, with most of them dying horribly. Even more recent finds have also thrown light on the possible fate of the settlers with the discovery of a secret fort on a map that John Y created in the 16th century. The symbol for the fort was hidden under a patch on his map that was created with a rudimentary form of invisible ink. Oh my god, this is so cool. <laughs> so it was only visible when lit from behind. It wasn't until 2012 that anyone realized anything was under the patch, and it seems to point to a possible new settlement about 50 miles inland from Roanoke Island, a distance White had previously referred to in his reports. Digs at the site, known as Site X, were carried out in 2015 and a couple of miles away at another site known as Site Y in 2019. These digs did turn up some European pottery, but it might have come from later settlers and not necessarily the Roanoke group. Also, the new site would have been in the heart of hostile territory, so it seems unlikely that the whole group would have decided that that's a safe bet. That is, like, cool and suspicious, though. The choices for the fate of the settlers basically comes down to assimilation or annihilation. For my money, the settlers did go to Croatoan Island. I, yeah, yeah, Katie, I agree with you. This is now known as Hatteras Island, and archaeological excavations have found traces of 16th century English life, like guns mixed in with traditional native arrowheads. From there, they either lived with the Croatoan tribe or potentially split into smaller groups that traveled further inland and maybe assimilated with other tribes too. They may then have experienced attacks, etc., as per the Dare Stone. Yeah, the Dare Stone can be real, and it can still fit in with this assimilation theory. I like the assimilation theory. It's kind of a, a happy ending for them, and it's also cool, 
And I mean, with the European clothes and the, the people who looked like semi-European and stuff, this seems likely. To this day, there are Native American tribes claiming to be descendants of Roanoke, but it's difficult to prove without DNA from the original colonists who have never been found. The grey-eyed, light-skinned people with western dress sense that explorer John Lawson encountered in the early 1700s seems to be a pretty compelling argument for assimilation. The Hatteras area was not particularly popular with later settlers, so it is possible that the only European candidates were the Roanoke people. They also apparently spoke English, but again, more English colonies had sprung up since 1587, so we can't categorically confirm their own settlers as the source. And just to throw a little more doubt in here, some populations of indigenous Americans have really high instances of albinism. It can occur once in every 1,500 to 2,000 people in Navajo populations and one in every 200 people in Hopi populations. That is incredibly high. I mean, I think about all, like, I don't know any albino people and I, I mean, I've never met an albino person, so it must be rare in in europe at least so while it might seem very far-fetched there is just the smallest chance that the purported mixed race descendants lawson saw were not actually mixed at all and of course there's yeah but there's a difference between someone albino and who looks like european isn't there i mean there is and, and you'd know someone who's albino you like, i mean i've seen pictures of albino people i've seen tv shows with albino people they you could tell they're albino <laughs> don't discriminate i'm not discriminating i'm not trying to be on pc here i'm just saying that if you <laughs> it's like that level of like i don't even notice their albinoism albinism albinism it's like but it's obvious and of course there's always the old fallback of alien abduction <laughs> of course there is a ship came down beamed the group up lock stop and stock and barrel leaving a one-word clue that baffled the human race for the next four and a half centuries there's no proof it happens but there's also no proof it didn't and let's absolutely ignore the alien theory because it's absurd this has been another episode of decoding the unknown i do hope you enjoyed it if you're watching this on youtube smash that like button subscribe if you're listening as a podcast and you want to review this show especially if you want to give it a five star review that would be grand please do that and i'll see you next time